Mm -hmm. Yes, but I think that perhaps then is when people start talking about things like uh, equality of opportunity, because I guess that one of the first things that comes to people's mind is that, so if we can explain 15% of the variance in terms of uh, academic success, let's say, b uh, among children, perhaps if we were to know that a particular child had certain traits from its birth, for example, mm -hmm. then perhaps we would try to uh, direct her more towards certain special uh, school programs or something like that, and then uh, she would not be exposed to the best education possible and then she would probably be missing on, on uh, missing on that or something like that uh, i mean what what would you say about that well again you raise many different issues there i mean equality of opportunity is something i go into in the book and um we got i hope everybody realizes that equality of opportunity doesn't equal equality of outcome <laughs> you know if you could give kids somehow exactly the same environments, does anyone still think they're all going to come out the same? You know, teachers don't think that. They can see that some kids just learn a lot better than other kids. And so there's another aspect you want to make sure you emphasize. Um, people worry about fatalism, the idea that if you know your genetic risk for something, um, you'll say there's nothing you can do about it. Well, again, that's misunderstanding of genetics. We're talking about if you, it's true, if you had a single gene disorder like Huntington's disease, it will kill you unless something else kills you first. It doesn't matter what your environment is. It doesn't matter about anything. It's deterministic and hardwired. And the problem is that's the way most people learn about genetics from Mendel on. These are single gene mutations that are like hardwired. Whereas here we're talking about thousands of DNA differences, a very tiny effect. And that is a real shift in perspective because it means we're talking about probabilistic propensities. You know, it's not pre-programmed, deterministic, innate sort of, um, well, it's just not deterministic in that same way. And so that's a very important point. So you mentioned what if you know that your child is has a high score on, we call it EA3, Educational Attainment 3, is this G genome-wide association study, polygenic score. What if you knew she had a high score or a low score? Well, before I get to that, let's look at some other polygenic scores that are around. Oh, b by the way, could I Can just ask you to tell people what is a polygenic score? Because I'm yes, not good. sure that you've good. already yeah. done that. No, that's right. Um, when I started talking about the early genome-wide association studies a decade ago, I said they did make some genome-wide significant hits. You know, they, they found some SNPs that were statistically significant after correcting for a million multiple tests. But the effect sizes were very small, 0.02% of the variance. What can you do with that? You know, it, you can't use it to predict. How are you going to trace gene behavior pathways if it's such a tiny effect? Well. The answer in the last few years has been to say you can put all those tiny effects together in what we call a poly multiple genetic score. It's what psychologists do all the time with items on a test. If we're measuring shyness, you don't just ask one question, you ask a few questions because no one item is going to be that predictive. It's, it's only capturing one aspect of it maybe. So you put them together and you score them on a test. You, you have to reverse them so they go in the right direction, so they all add up to a high score for shyness, for example. So that's all we're doing here, but we're adding up thousands of DNA differences. And the test then is how much of the variance does it predict in an independent sample? And so what the revolution in the last couple of years has been to say, don't just take the top hits, keep adding hits until you no longer add to the prediction in an independent sample. And when you take that approach, you end up adding tens of thousands of SNPs. So each of them have very small effects on average in the population. It could be that you and I have 5,000, 10,000 different SNPs that are particularly affecting our trait. 
But the point is you can add them up, you know, based on their effect size in the population, these tens of thousands of SNPs, and create a polygenic score that can predict the trait in an independent sample. And so in our study, we're predicting 15, 16% of the variance in these national tests of school achievement that all kids in the UK have to take when they leave school at the age of 16, at the end of compulsory education. So that this polygenic score is very important that people get that because that's, that's where, as I say, the DNA revolution is going to hit psychology because you can incorporate those in psychological research. And as I say in my book, they're going to make a huge difference in terms of clinical psychology as well. So you were asking about the negative aspects of this. And again, I'm a cheerleader. I see lots of good that can come from this. Any big discovery can do can be used for good or bad. We need to talk about these issues. But there's so many people talking about, um, I call them doomsayers, you know, all, all the negative things that could happen. So before we talk about educational achievement, think about, say, cardiovascular risk. There was a paper in Nature Genetics a couple months ago that shows that you can predict your chances of our DNA better than you can with just about anything else. And so we have polygenic scores that are very good predictors. And you can show in the UK, 8% of the people are walking around with a polygenic score above the clinical risk. That is a threefold greater risk than average. And so some people are saying, isn't it unethical that we are not telling people that they have this polygenic risk for heart attacks? Because you can prevent heart attacks in, in lots of ways, you know, just in terms of how you live, but also there are body scans and things that can be done that can tell you you're, you really need to start treating this person now. Don't wait till they have a heart attack. So the really cool thing about polygenic scores is they're going to allow us to move towards a preventive approach rather than waiting till people have problems and trying to fix them. Well, that's medical, but that's what's going to happen. I think the National Health Service is going to make polygenic scores available for everyone. In Finland, they started a program where if you go to the hospital and they take blood, you're asked, do you want, to, do you want this information to be made available? Do you want to participate in this research, but also to provide, to have the NHS provide that information, you know, if you are at risk for something? And people, everyone wants to do it, you know, and I think um, that's the way it's going to go. We'll do this medically, but then psychologically, all you got to do is it, do it once, and it's the same information. The same DNA chip can be used to give you right now, say, 250 polygenic scores. And that includes things like depression. They're not as good. Schizophrenia is one of the better ones. Reading, cognitive abilities. So I think this is going to happen. And um, if you think of problems, like, no one minds if you say you're going to do something with genetics and reading disability. But if you talk about reading ability, people get more upset along the lines that you were saying. But what about some psychological things like alcoholism? If you knew you were at, say, a five-fold greater risk of being alcoholic based on your DNA, I think that would be important for prevention because you cannot become alcoholic unless you drink a lot of alcohol. So... If you knew that you, or your child even, were, was at high risk for alcohol, you can tell your child, look, there might be this problem. It doesn't mean you're going to be alcoholic, but you're taking a risk. If you go out and drink as much as an adolescent with your friends, as they do, they're not at risk genetically for being alcoholic, but you are. Now, it doesn't, you know, it's not, it's probabilistic. You want to emphasize that. But would you want to take that risk? You know, because alcoholism is, we talk about drugs and alcohol. Dr alcohol is the worst drug around in terms of the damage it does to people and society. So that uh, prevention, I think, is an important way of approaching this. So then you get to the hard one. What about educational achievement? And what if you knew that your kid had a low polygenic score for educational achievement? Well, this is the toughest case because we value that so much, especially university-educated parents you know, have a lot of trouble you know, if their kid doesn't want to go to university. Well, you think of me and my sister. We, we were both, when we went to school, I loved it. I did really well at it. So I did it more and I loved it. And, um, you know, she didn't. Well, suppose she had a low EA3 polygenic score. And do we want to force everybody 
to be on that same academic standard. And I think people in Europe are better than in the UK and the US. Those are the only two cultures I know. But I hear in Germany and Switzerland, I don't know about Portugal, that a lot of parents, middle class parents, they wouldn't push their kids in an academic track. It's a, 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 um, I don't know if you call it an apprenticeship track, but something where you learn some occupation like, you know, programming, engineering, you know, I, I think it's a much more secure uh, post for a, a child, you know, that they could get a job that will pay them a decent salary, that sort of thing. Um, and so I think it is important then to even recognize that this academic sort of intelligence that we value so much, there are big differences there. And are we only going to evaluate people on that one standard, you know, and make them do things that, like my sister, that she didn't really like to do? She's not, she knows she's not very good at it. You know, why does she have to keep beating her head against the wall and feeling like a failure? She ended up being a very good lab technician. You know, she just loves doing robot like repetitive things very accurately, very fast. You know, and, you know, who's, she's happy as a clam. I mean, she makes a good salary and she's probably much more secure in her future than a lot of, uh, you think of poor PhD students these days and the uncertainty of their future. And, and, and really fundamentally, do we need more professors or do we need more plumbers and engineers and programmers and, you know, people who are, it's said that half of the kids growing up now are going to be doing jobs that we don't even know exist now. So we need to be more flexible in our approach and not judge everyone against one standard. But it is hard when you get, you know, if you uh, people who adopt children, uh, a lot of my friends, you know, they spend all their life not getting pregnant. And then finally, they're at a point where they want to get pregnant and they can. So many of them adopt children. And I'm amazed at how many of them don't even think about genetics. They really do believe at some deeper level uh, that all it takes is tender, loving care and, you know, give the kids lots of books to read and, and everyone's going to go to university and be brilliant. But, you know, if they're lucky, they get a kid of average intelligence. But the average IQ of people with PhDs is 130. The difference between 130 and 100 is the difference between 100 and 70, which is borderline mental you know, intellectual disability. So the relative difference there is really great. And I find it, a lot of these parents have great difficulty with that because they, they value this university education and academic training so much. And it, and it creates real conflict. But what is going to be important about the DNA revolution is people will begin to see how different kids in the same family are. Because, you know, you're 50% similar to your siblings. But that means you're 50% different genetically. So if you take two kids in the population at random, their average difference in IQ is about um, 17 IQ points, I think it is. Oh, no, 13, isn't it? And you take two kids in a family, you know, families with siblings, and you look at their average difference, and it's like 10. There's a big range of genetic differences within a family. And the really nice thing about DNA is it tells you about individual risk and prediction. It's not like your father's alcoholic, all the kids in the family have a five-fold greater risk of alcoholism. It could say that you have a much greater risk of alcoholism. DNA could. But your sibling doesn't have a risk. So I think the idea of using DNA to study differences within a family is going to be an important way to go here. But I get off the topic, really, um, uh, of how do you deal with uh, say self-fulfilling prophecies is partly what you were after and labeling kids and all of that. These are issues we need to address, but um, I, I think um, the possibilities for using DNA to personalize ed education will be an important way to go. Right now we just have these very general genetic predictors of educational achievement and intelligence. But I think we will, I'm very keen to get specific predictors for like STEM, you know, um, subjects like, you know, science, technology, and uh, engineering and math, independent of intelligence even. Because although a lot of genetic influences are general across 
many abilities, there's still a lot of specific genetic influence. And I think it would be incredibly useful to be able to get at those specific abilities as well. And, just, and also on the disability side, I mean, if you knew that your child would, if the genetic you, you could now predict about, say, 8% of the variance in reading ability in children with DNA. It's, but, um, but if you knew your kid had a high risk of reading disability, instead of waiting until they get to school and then fail at reading, which is what we do now, you could actually predict early that they might have problems with reading. Yet we know most reading, kids with reading problems at school had language problems earlier. And you can't intervene with reading early because at three they're not reading, but they're certainly using language. So if you could intervene with language early, you might be able to prevent reading problems. Now you might say, well, why not do that for everybody? But the answer is that effective interventions are intensive, long-term, and expensive. Um, these magic bo silver bullets, you know, these cheap little tricks, gimmicks that will change reading problems. You know, they never work. So if it's going to be intensive and long term, it's going to be expensive. And that probably means you have to try to predict which kids are most likely to have those problems and then really go for it. You know, do whatever you can to help prevent these problems from occurring. So even in the educational realm, I can see a lot of positive uh, advantages to the, the DNA. But as I say, I'm a real cheerleader for this stuff. I acknowledge that there are these problems and issues that we need to discuss. And again, that's why I wanted to write this book, to get people talking about these topics. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you've raised some very interesting points there, because uh, I think that from a certain point on, we're no longer, re we're no longer really talking about uh, science and we're moving on to perhaps ethics and social values and social norms. Because, for example, when you referred to the case of you and your sister, uh, one thing that immediately came to my mind is that perhaps uh, in, in the so-called weird societies, that is the Western, educated, industrialized, rich, rich and, and democratic, that we put too much, too much value into being intelligent by itself. And, and for example, perhaps there are many people, as you say, that would be perfectly happy with having a trade job, for example. And here in Portugal, sometimes it's very sad because people really devalue people who, who have those kinds of occupations and perhaps only value people who go to university and are doctors and lawyers and politicians and dentists and university professors and other things like that. And, and I mean, there, there are also a lot of other aspects to consider because, for example, someone might be high in IQ but, for example, low in conscientiousness, and, uh, and then <laughs> that person might, might, might not be that good uh, really in, in also pursuing uh, a higher education, let's say, because it's not only a matter of being, of being very intelligent, it's also a matter of, of putting the work on and uh, other stuff like that and, and really following a schedule and, and things like that, yeah. right? Yeah, well, I, I, I agree completely with everything you say. And as you say, this is getting out of the realm of science and into areas that I'm not an expert in, but in this book, I thought I had to address some of the implications, like in terms of equal opportunity, as you said, and meritocracy. Because in a way, the genetics suggests kind of paradoxical, uh, has some paradoxical implications for some of these topics. So I go into that in the book. I don't know if we want to go into those here. But the, the first point I make, though, is that there are no necessary policy implications of finding genetic influence. That has to do with your values. You could have right-wing values, and you might actually 
stupidly probably say, if, if from a right wing point of view, why not educate the best and forget the rest? And then society can have these people who make all these great discoveries. I think that would be very short sighted because the intellectual capital of a society is not just based on the few people who invent social media and things like that. It requires a whole infrastructure of people who can make things happen as a result of that. So the other perspective, though, like a Finnish model of education is to say, um, let's recognize some kids are going to have a lot of trouble learning. And what will our values say, let's put as much resource into the opposite end of the continuum, not the best, but the ones who have the most trouble and do whatever it takes to bring them up to minimal levels of literacy and numeracy because you no longer can participate in society unless you have those basic uh, literacy skills. So it's a matter of your values, I think, and you hope that you can make better decisions with knowledge than without, uh, but that may be a little Pollyannish these days. But uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not that convinced that um, policymakers care that much about data really i mean you know they can make their decisions and if some data come along that kind of fit what they're saying fine but if if the data doesn't confirm what they're saying they're not too troubled by it because they they just want to make this difference so um it's it's an important issue though the these policy related issues but i do want to emphasize that my um thoughts about it are no better than anybody else's because you know, it's not my area of expertise, but I thought in the book I had to address some of these issues. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about the ways by which uh, clinical psychology and psychiatry classify mental conditions, because you also talk a little bit about that in your book and you refer to the fact that perhaps we should change the way we do it. Uh, for example, instead of using a qualitative system of, quanti uh, of classification, uh, perhaps moving on to a quantitative system, because it seems that uh, these mental uh, pathologies or diseases or conditions, whatever you want to call them, they occur in a continuum. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I do think it's a very important aspect of the DNA revolution. So there's first the issue of genetic influence. And I think clinical psychology had trouble with genetics in the 70s and 80s because they thought, well, if these are genetic, genetically influenced, it puts us out of business. It means you can't do anything about it. Well, I hope in my book I make it clear that just because something's genetically influenced does not mean you can't do anything about it. And because causes and cures aren't necessarily related, but it's, it's important to know if you think schizophrenia is caused by what your parents do to you in the first few years of life, it's just wrong. And if you have therapies, like a lot of the psychoanalytic therapies that are based on going back to how your parents treated you in the first three years of life, that's wrong. It's not going to go anywhere. So it is important to understand that genetics is important, but it's also important to say that doesn't mean you can't do something about it. You know, the best example, unfortunately, there aren't many of these examples, but the best one, you know, is phenylketonuria, PKU, which caused in the, in the 40s and 50s about 1% of the severely mental, uh, retarded, institutionalized patients. And that's a single gene cause. It's recessive, but it's, you know, totally genetic. And yet, um, the reason why we screen all newborns around the world for this with that little heel prick that they do when a baby's first born to get a little bit of blood is to test for this genetic disorder and now many other genetic disorders. But the reason it's done is from, because from a cost-benefit point of view, you can't afford not to do it because this genetic disease can be um, treated as too strong. But you can avoid the problems of, uh, you know, this gene causes um, uh, a breakdown in metabolism of phenylalanine. You can't metabolize phenylalanine, which is one of those amino acids you get, you don't produce yourself. You get from the outside, like in, especially in early breast milk called colostrum, and then also in uh, dairy products and red meat. 
well, if you can't break down phenylalanine, which you need, but if you can't break it down, it builds up in the developing brain and somehow, we still don't know how, causes this massive mental retardation. So people putting this together said, what if we give kids a diet low in phenylalanine? And that pretty much takes care of the problem. So there is a completely genetic disorder that's completely um, cured is too strong. They still have the genetic problem, but it, it's sidestepped the uh, bullet in a way. And these people end up with pretty normal IQs. It's, there's still problems that come about, but it's a great example, though, of how the causes of something aren't necessarily related to the cures. And I'm sure that's true in clinical psychology as well. So those are all basic, important genetic issues. But the very specific one that most people haven't quite caught on to yet is that polygenic scores involve thousands of DNA differences. So, you know, the central limit theorem, which is the basis of all probability and statistics, says that, uh, you know, it, like if you flip, it, it, it basically says you will get a normal distribution if you've got a lot of things that affect something. So if you've got, you know, if you flip a coin, say you flip 10 coins, 100 uh, time and time again, and count the number of heads, you know, it'll, you, mostly the average will be five, and you'll get a distribution around that, but it'll be a perfectly normal distribution if you keep doing this experiment, flip the coin uh, 10 times, uh, you know, do it 100 times or whatever, you get this normal distribution. Well, that's what we're doing with genes, too. We're flipping alleles. They can either be one or the other, and so it's a bit like that, and you get a perfectly normal distribution so that the, the polygenic score for schizophrenia, autism, reading disability, achievement, these are all perfectly normal. There's no point at which there's any break. And so that means for, we all have thousands of DNA differences that push us a little bit towards schizophrenia. It's all quantitative, though. It's a question of how many. It's more or less. And the idea that we should find this cut point, threshold, that once you cross that, you're schizophrenic. And until you cross that, you're not schizophrenic. I mean, no clinician believes that's true for any psychological disorder, right? That it, you know, alcoholism, obesity, none of these common problems are like that. There, there are genetic problems like that, single gene disorders. They are necessary and sufficient. They're either or. You know, as I said, you have the gene for Huntington's, it's dominant, it will kill you. So that's dichotomous, qualitative. But in psychology, we're only dealing with these common quantitative disorders. So that's why the chapter is called um, The Abnormal is Normal, in the sense that there isn't uh, illness or not. And it really comes from the medical model, which says that we ought to start by this diagnosis. You know, do you have cholera or not? And then to say, what is the cause of cholera? And that works for a lot of medical diseases, and it works for single gene disorders, but it doesn't work when we're dealing with common quantitatively distributed traits. So I, there's lots of reasons not to like diagnoses, including, you know, it's like us versus them. You know, there are those poor schizophrenics, and then there are those, us normal people. And it's not. We're all schizophrenic to some extent. It's just a, a quantitative issue. And then the implications that follow are, are pretty amazing. If there are no disorders, that's what I'm saying. There are no disorders. There are only dimensions. If there are no disorders, there's no disorder to cure. All we can do is alleviate symptoms. It's quantitative. It's not, are you cured or not? It's a question of how much you can ameliorate the symptoms, how much you can prevent the problems from developing from this continuum. So there's, there's, two or three other uh, examples of the ways in which polygenic scores will transform clinical psychology. But um, the one, the, uh, another one I mentioned before is prevention. Because with DNA, you can predict your height, your weight, your, schi your schizophrenia, schizophrenic risk from birth just as well as you can now as an adult. And that means it's the perfect early warning system for preventing problems rather than waiting until problems occur. And there is increasing evidence that even with schizophrenia, certainly with alcoholism and other, some other problems, depression, 
if you can prevent these problems, you know, if you knew your child's at risk for depression, say, for example, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, is probably good for all of us. It's basically healthy thinking. You know, don't ruminate about all the bad stuff that have happened to you. You know, think about some of the positive things. Think about how you can change the things that are wrong. You know, it's just common sense in a way, isn't it? You know, like healthy thinking. It's probably good for all of us, but it might be especially good for people who have a propensity towards depression, you know, to stop themselves when they're getting into that rumination about, oh, God, that was so terrible, and I'm such a bad person and all of that. So I, I, I do think this prevention will probably be the way in which we uh, polygenic scores will really make a difference in clinical psychology. Um, but one other example is the idea that um, we'll move away from the idea of one size fits all in terms of treatment to thinking about personalizing it. Like, as soon as we get a polygenic score, say for ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, so, you know, in, in America especially, but increasingly in England, not so much in the rest of Europe, I think, if a kid is diagnosed as a an amphetamine as a drug treatment, methylphenidate, Ritalin. And you know, there are reasons why that probably helps kids. I mean, those of us from the 60s and 70s know that speed, amphetamine, helps you concentrate. So that's probably true, too, for ADHD kids. But, you know, if, if you could get a polygenic score that would predict which kids would profit from it and which kids won't, or this will really make a difference. If you could find a polygenic score that would predict which kids are damaged by it, you know, because it's not a not a, a nice thing to be giving amphetamines to young kids, you know, for lots of reasons. So if you didn't have to, that would be great. But if you shouldn't, that is, it could really have a negative effect on kids. Parents would demand this. And I think where it's really going to happen first is, again, in the medical area. Because right now, you can get a polygenic score to predict whether you'll have Alzheimer's when you get older. And that's this one gene, apolipoprotein E, that has a big effect on it. But with these direct-to-consumer genotyping services, right now, you can find out if you have this gene, this allele called ApoE4, that greatly increases your risk for Alzheimer's. So at 85 years of age, 80 years of age, we all have like a 10% risk of being Alzheimer's, having Alzheimer's, which is very high. But if you have um, it, two form, uh, alleles for this recessive um, trait, if you have, for this gene, if you have two of those alleles, your risk goes from 10% to 80%. So that is, as these things go, that's a very big uh, risk factor. So right now, people almost, a lot of people don't want to know. I find among my colleagues, you can do the direct-to-consumer testing and you have to tick a box yes, I want to know my Alzheimer's risk score. You don't get it then. You still have to then later say, yes, I really want to get it. And then, yes, I understand what, you know, I'm asking about here. Because, you know, it's a big deal if you found out you have an 80% risk of having Alzheimer's disease when you get older. I find you ask university colleagues about it, and they kind of split down the middle. Half of the people say, no way do I want to know. It would ruin my life. But the other half, which I'm in, I say, of course I want to know. I mean, I want to, I, there are things you can do, even though you can't cure it. There are things you can do, right? You could predict, I mean, you could plan for it, for example. You know, you could plan socially, but also financially, you know you're going to need care later in life. And also it might make you, you know, carpe diem, the idea, you know, you might decide, well, I better really enjoy my life now because later in life I have this significant risk of having Alzheimer's, which, you know, it, it, at least you could say, well, you gotta, you got to live a long time before you get the Alzheimer's. But what if now, with this polygenic score, the problem right now is you can't do anything about it. I mean, the one thing you can do is avoid boxing and head injuries. That's the only known environmental cause. For, I mean, it's a small effect, but it's, it does have an effect. But what if someone came along with a drug that like most of these drugs, they don't fix the problem once it occurs. But if you could take a drug early in life that could prevent 
or at least ameliorate or stall the onset of Alzheimer's, everybody would want to get this polygenic score. So I think that's where it's going to happen. And then it will eventually spill over into psychology. Because really, is Alzheimer's a medical disease? It's actually psychological. Have you ever noticed anything that becomes useful like Alzheimer's or important suddenly is no longer dementia, which is purely psychological, right? I mean, all we know is memory loss and, you know, problems like that. These are psychological problems, but this is a medical disease. Yeah, okay, the brain is messed up, but the brain's involved in everything in psychology. That doesn't make it a, a neurological disorder. So it is psychological, but I think more and more this polygenic score revolution is going to flow over from the medical area into psychology because once you get your DNA, it, you can use that to get any polygenic score, including psychological polygenic scores. So another reason, so these are all ways in which um, the DNA revolution and polygenic scores are already beginning to transform clinical psychology. Um, I'm glad to have a chance to talk about that, Ricardo, though, because I do get a, a few clinicians who write and say, well, what good is any of this? And, you know, finding DNA because I get it from teachers too. You know, you get this kid who's hyperactive and having reading problems. I mean, what good is this stuff for that teacher in that classroom? And, you know, fair enough in some ways. I, I do think it's important for a teacher or a clinician to say, um, well, we don't just blame the person or the parents. We realize people are different genetically and that kind of changes your perspective a bit. You know, you're not thinking this kid is just a terrible kid or the parents are terrible parents you know you realize kids are just different genetically but it, it's it, fair enough to say I, I, you know for the teacher or the clinician confronted with this very disruptive aggressive kid who's having all sorts of problems at school i don't know how much this is going to help genetically but certainly from a larger perspective and the idea of prevention i think it could help Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and now that we're talking about clinical psychology, could it be possible that perhaps uh, two problems that it has and from uh, from uh, and perhaps the other things, the other problems stem from these is that on the one hand, uh, p perhaps they rely too much still on patients' reports. That is, they ask people to tell them uh, to tell them about p basically uh, the main events yeah. in their lives and things like that. And I mean, they haven't yet incorporated properly these genetic tools into their practice. And of course, if they ask people to talk about their lives, th that's all that people can do and people can't really tell them about their genetics. And yeah. uh, on the other hand, uh, perhaps it would it could be possible that uh, clinical psychologists also have somewhat of a biased sample of people from the the overall population because I mean mm -hmm. perhaps th there tends to be certain people with certain personality traits or certain other psychological traits that uh, tend to seek help from clinical psychologists or psychiatrists and then also a thing that really comes about in the behavioral genetics literature that is related to the fact that if people grow up or develop in deprived environments then those then the environmental effects have uh, influence much more their development than uh, than happens with people that uh, are not really deprived of anything when they're developing and then perhaps that's when we obtain a larger genetic effect so I, I mean do any of these does any of these make sense or well, absolutely. You, you, again, you raised several different questions there. I don't know if I can keep track of all of them. But the first one was about um, 
uh, clinicians only working with symptoms. So the only way you know about depression is the person tells you they're depressed. And what's interesting about polygenic scores is this is not a symptom, it's a cause, it's a predictive cause. And that's a different ball game for clinicians. Yeah, it doesn't explain everything. You can get people with high polygenic scores for depression who aren't depressed. But wouldn't it be good to know if the person you're seeing has a high genetic score for depression or not? I mean, that it ought to tell you something. You'd think the person without a high polygenic score might have more environmental causes of it. I mean, causes and cures aren't related. Just because it's genetic doesn't mean you have to give them drugs for depression. It's just surely that's got to be useful information, um, this, the polygenic score down the line. So I don't think clinicians should think about genetics as being somehow in opposition to what they do. It's got to add to their uh, ability to detect problems. And, and also, again, to think about prevention. Rather than being a clinician waiting for people to get depressed and suicidal, what, wouldn't it be so much better if we try to get out in front of the uh, wave and prevent problems from occurring? And there's a lot of interest in doing that, you know, in, in clinical psychology, I mean, especially here in England. It's actually a very big program to try and, um, pro, you know, identify people who are at risk for depression and do something about it before they're depressed. So uh, that was just the first question you asked. And, you know, again, I don't disagree with anything you said about the rest of that question, but perhaps you can, if there's a, a specific question you wanted to ask me in that uh, last bit of what you were talking about, uh, yes, perhaps about the behavioral genetics part, uh, the one about uh, people who grow up in deprived environments, perhaps uh, having uh, th their behavior having uh, a bigger environmental effects there. Perhaps, I mean, they, they could be deprived of, of food, of water, of hygiene, of health care. I mean, ma many yeah. very different things, but... Uh, p perhaps those are the cases that are the most extreme ones in terms of developing a full-fledged mental condition as the ones that we find in textbooks or... or yeah, well again, we're only studying the populations we study and so if you uh, talked about um, a, a society in which people are, are really at the limits of um, environmental, you know, if you get kids who, like the orphanage sorts of studies that are done, you, you can have, it's, you could have a big effect. And so we're only studying this normal range of variation and we're saying these systematic environmental influences don't seem to be so important. But it's, it's kind of hard to believe, isn't it, that severe neglect wouldn't leave marks on kids. But even there, like in these Romanian orphanage studies that my colleague Mike Rudder works on, you know, where they came from Romania, and these were the worst sorts of institutions you could imagine. These, But the amazing thing is so many of those kids end up being perfectly fine. Now, how do you explain that? You know, is it a resilience? Is it a genetic resilience? So on average, that would have a pretty bad effect, as you could imagine. But there are still big individual differences. And fortunately, not many environments, I've never seen environments one-tenth as bad as those orphanage environments. So in the range of studies that we, samples we look at, it's probably not a significant contributor to environmental influence. But again, we're only describing what is, we're not saying what could be. And surely we could devise ways of screwing kids up, you know, like people often say, well, but if you put a, lock them in a closet, you know, that sort of thing. Well, that's, that's what could be. And, you know, we don't, we can't really speak to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So perhaps just one last question. Um, according to the current state of the art in terms of identifying the genes through genome line association studies that are uh, associated with certain particular psychological traits, uh, would you say that perhaps uh, uh, w from what we know by now, it would justify in the near future 
using uh, uh, gene editing technologies to go to the specific genes and uh, trying to altering them to prevent certain certain conditions like I, I don't know for example uh, Alzheimer's or the risk of developing depression and things like that and I'm, I'm not asking you about the ethics nor about if the, yeah. if the gene editing technology works or not but from what we know in terms of the percentage of the variation that is explained by the genes that we've already identified uh, with the several different psychological traits and conditions what would you say about that well um, CRISPR you know these gene editing techniques that have just come up in the last few years are amazing in their potential for editing specific bits of DNA what we're already seeing though is that it's it's a bit more complicated sometimes there are unintended consequences um, but it's still an amazing technique but how is it ever going to work if what you're talking about are thousands of DNA differences and you could see where you could change an embryo where you know it's a few cells or with sperm and egg where there's just one cell basically in the initial zygote you could see doing gene editing there for a single gene disorder. But how are you going to do it if there's tens of thousands of genes? And the other thing is, unless you're doing it with that first cell or the first few cells, how are you going to change the trillions of cells in our body? You, know, you can't, I don't see how you can do that unless it's a very specific sort of thing like an eye problem or something, you know? So um, I don't really see that gene editing is going to have much of an impact on psychological traits other than single gene disorders and even there I think it's going to have to be at a prenatal stage you know so uh, for some medical disorders it, it's likely to be quite useful to correct genetic changes but uh, uh, problems but on the other hand there's a lot of concern about changing the human genome because if you do anything, then that would be an inherited DNA difference. For the best of intentions, it's a very complex, highly interconnected system, and un the risk of unintended consequences are severe. As we've seen just recently, people have raised all these issues in relation to the supposed babies who in China who were um, gene edited at uh, conception. So. Never say never, but um, I don't really see how it's going to have an impact on psychological traits um, in, in, the, in my foreseeable future, and maybe even in yours. <laughs> Yes, and I mean, we've been focusing a lot on the fact that complex traits are polygenic, but I think that there's also the complication here of uh, many genes having pleiotropic effects, that is, yes. that, that, that they uh, interact with several other products and give rise to different traits, being them psychological or strictly physical. So, I mean, if we were, for example, to identify seven genes uh, that, that if we were to alter them, it would improve our IQ in, I don't know, one or two points. But if at the same time we were to know that it would raise the probability of developing a neurological disease, for example, in 40%, perhaps it wouldn't be worth the risk, right? Yeah, that's what I... Um, unintended consequences, but I'm glad you raised this point about uh, pleiotropy. You know, the, the two big principles in genetics, one is pleiotropy. Every gene does lots of different things. You know, sometimes we call this a gene insulin receptor. Well, all these genes do many different things. So that's pleiotropy. But the converse of that is the other rule called polygenicity, polygenic, that is any trait is influenced by many genes. So if each gene, each DNA difference affects a lot of traits, then each trait is going to be influenced by a lot of these DNA differences. 
And those two things make it very difficult to see how you're going to trace pathways from genes to brain to behavior. People will try to do that, and that's great. But um, I think it's, it's the reason why changing the DNA of any bit of the genome, the probability of unintended consequences for somebody is pretty severe, I would think, because there are no simple gene-brain-behavior relationships. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so Dr. Plomin, just before we go, uh, apart from your books and the other things I've already referred to in the introduction, would you like to tell people what are some of the best places on the internet if they want to have uh, to get in touch with more of your work? Well, I think uh, it would be interesting for people to read the dozens of reviews I've had and interviews. So if you just Google Robert Plowman and then you do the news thing, you know, you can click on news, then that's a really good place to start because, you know, a lot of those reviews are very thoughtful, very uh, extensive. Some are like five-page sorts of reviews in the Times and that sort of thing. So I think that would be a great way of um, getting uh, more familiarity with this area. And then that would lead to more in-depth study if people wanted to do that. I should also say that in the back of my book, there are 60 pages of notes that give that document all the things I talk about and, and refer people with web links. All of the articles, everything have, have web links. So um, it, uh, it would be, uh, people can learn as much as they want to learn about it. And then also for real serious students, there's the textbook that you mentioned, Behavioral Genetics. So that's another way to go. But it's really an up and coming area, up and coming area. And what excites me is that it's not just behavioral genetics now in psychologists. These are some of the hottest stuff is being done in behavioral economics and, you know, I think eventually I hope in education as well. But sociology, I mean, a, a lot of areas are finally getting the genetic message. And in part, I think that's because of DNA. You can just ask questions you could never ask before. So I think it's, we're just starting to see the effect of the DNA revolution in all the behavioral sciences, actually in all the life sciences. The problems we're addressing, missing heritability, finding genes for complex traits, these aren't psychological problems, these aren't even behavioral issues specifically. All the life sciences, medical sciences, biological sciences, these are the same issues that we're all addressing. So some of the brightest minds in science are tackling these issues, and that makes me even more optimistic that uh, the pace of discovery in this area is going to increase. And also, I think, I sort of wanted to get this point in, looking back on this five years from now, certainly 10 years from now, we're going to realize how little we knew, you know, and I find that tremendously exciting. You know, a lot of areas of psychology are boring. It just seems like it's the same old stuff. You don't solve problems, you get bored with them, and then you go running off in some other direction with some other fad. And what I love about the genetics in psychology and everywhere is that it's progressive. You know, we're building information. And we, you know, make mistakes. You got to go back and reconstruct stuff. But it is very progressive. And the technological changes um, have just dramatically upped the rate of progression in this area. So I wish I could be a student now, you know, and just starting the career because this is. Uh, it, it's just going to be amazing, I think, in the next 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So, Dr. Plomin, I would really like to thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. Uh, and, I mean, it was really a pleasure and an honor to be able to talk to you. I've been a really big fan of your work, so... Well, thank you, Ricardo. It's really great talking to you, too. I, I've done a lot of interviews, probably about... 50 or so in the last few months. And um, uh, it makes such a difference to talk to someone who, who knows the area a bit. You know, I just had an interview the other day where someone just said, well, I understand you have this book that's come out. Can you tell me what it's about? <laughs> go, oh, no, because I realize I can't do short interviews. That's why I appreciate an interview like this, 
it's just too complicated to try and get across in one of these television interviews, which if you get five minutes is considered incredibly long. And so I'm just not doing those anymore because you can't do justice to the complexity of these topics in short little sound bites. So that's why I really appreciate an interview like this and an interviewer like you who knows their stuff. So thank you very much, Ricardo. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you a lot for watching this interview until the end and also, by the way, for coming to my channel. Uh, as you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep this channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge. Any amount, even if just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelina, Jim Frank, Francis Ford and Hans Frederick Sunda. Thank you for all.